Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin in about 30 seconds, so go ahead and find your seat and prepare to worship. Down deep in 
such a happy day. seated. Okay, good morning. Hey, let's give it up for that worship team right there. That was groovy, huh? I just want to welcome everybody to the central region of the Boston Church of Christ. And uh, there's probably eight or nine services just like this happening around the greater Boston area. Uh, my name is Gary Slobodnik, and along with my wife, Ann Mayer, who's uh, the pretty lady in the first row, uh, we want to welcome you, and um, we're longtime members of the church, and we're also longtime residents of Arlington, and um, so I just want to really extend a warm welcome to you, whether or not you found us online, or whether you were just walking by the building, or whether it's you know some people here, just really want to extend, um, we're so happy that you're here, and I just want to say that the Boston Church is a place where people want to come and get to know God better, uh, we uh, learn from his word, and we also learn from each other. And so that's some of the things you can expect. Um, I will say, I don't know about you, but when, we, when I get to the month of August, I start thinking, oh, man, uh, there's only like 30 days left in the summer. I got to, you know, I, uh, concerned. And then I kind of woke up and I realized that today is August 13th. And so I sort of missed my August 1st wake up call. And so I'm thinking August 13th. Wow, I'm, I'm, it's like two weeks to go. So I don't know if you've gotten away for the summer, if you've had some time to just enjoy whatever you do in the summer. But if not, uh, you better get to it because you know, we're, we're down to a couple of things to go. So just to give you the heads up, uh, that's, uh, that was for free today. Uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to say that um, we've got a great service for you today. Uh, we've got uh, Emma Volany going to share her thoughts about communion, which is going to be great. Um, we've got Victoria Wright who's going to share her thoughts about uh, contribution today. And then we have a super special guest today uh, in Sean Wooten joining us today and right over there. A super warrior in the faith. Val's going to say a few more thoughts a little later in the service, uh, but that's going to be uh, an awesome message for us today. Um, I wanted to share a scripture here, uh, one of my favorites of all time, Psalm 100. I'm just going to read this down. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So that's an awesome way to focus our minds on worshiping God today. Uh, I will mention that the Hislops are celebrating their 30th anniversary. Good for them. They're out of town for a little bit longer. An extra special thought for Lillian, just 
enduring and all that. Can, oh, I, 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 yeah, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't take a cheap shot when Rich is not here to defend himself. All right, yeah. Praise the Lord for both of them, right? Praise the Lord for both of them. All right. But right now we're going to pray, and then we're going to continue on with our service. Let's pray. Dear Holy God, we uh, come before you, Lord, and you are God, Father, and your, uh, your faithfulness uh, endures forever. And uh, we do approach you, Father, today. We want to learn from you. We want to praise you. We want to honor you. And uh, we want to draw closer to you today. And uh, we, uh, we just want to pray for the service. Uh, we also want to just pray for world events, Father, that are going on, uh, particularly those in Maui with such a a difficult situation there. We just pray that you'd uh, work with all of the recovery efforts and everything that's going on there. Uh, of course, there's strife and challenges all around the world, Father, in Ukraine and uh, uh, just uh, so many other places in the world. We just pray that uh, your peace uh, and your Holy Spirit would be working in those situations. And uh, we also just pray for uh, our time here in Boston and uh, just for the church and the work here and just that people would get to know who you are. And uh, we're thankful, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we continue our worship. Blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. So I trust in God. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, 
and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord.
Please be seated. All right, amen. Um, well, now we have our time where we get to prepare our hearts and minds to reflect at the foot of the cross. And one of the things I love about the kingdom is the kingdom is filled with many people who I would consider foundations to the church, both men and women, people who serve, who are present, and who add and build up the faith and culture that impacts so many people. And I'm happy to introduce one of those people that I believe to be Emma Volany. And I'm super excited that we get to, 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 to listen to her today and to hear what she has to share um, about how she connects at the foot of the cross. Uh, but without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Emma. Um, thank you so much, Tyler. I'm not used to holding a mic, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I just wanted to say good morning, everyone. So as Tyler mentioned, my name is Emma. Um, and one thing that I've been thinking about recently when I think about communion is what does it mean to prepare your heart? Um, especially when communion is entirely about Jesus and his sacrifice. And so I thought maybe today I'd just share a perspective that I've had recently. So at my core, I am a rules follower. I love the law. I love knowing what the rules are and respecting them. Uh, I used to strongly believe that rules were meant to be followed, not broken. Do we have any naturally rebellious people in the crowd today? Yeah, anyone who just really hates the rules, maybe? Yeah, you wouldn't have liked me in elementary school for sure. Um, a few examples. I used to put myself in timeout. No parent necessary. <laughs> It would be fair to say in middle school that I was a teacher's pet. Um, it would also be fair to say that I was an enforcer of the law. Um, <laughs> in high school, I was selected to be part of my school's honor board, which was essentially just like to be a student representative on the disciplinary committee. Um, <laughs> and you know, so, so that's just like a little bit about me and how much I love the law and I think you know, when I read my Bible, I think, wow, I would have really succeeded as a Pharisee. <laughs> um, so if you don't know much about the Pharisees, they were a group of Jewish people who were devoted to the law and believed that ritual and traditions really helped them know God. Um, and that, that's really awesome. Um, but I think that there are also a lot of really great struggles that come with that mindset. And Jesus called calls the Pharisees out a ton of times on their hypocrisy in this way. Um, because one of them is to follow tradition and rules mindlessly, allowing their hearts to be miles and miles away um, from them. And that's something that I have to watch my heart about constantly. But I think part of why the Pharisees were so set on tradition is that there's a lot of safety in following the rules. It's really hard to criticize someone when they're doing the rules correctly. Um, even if their heart is not in it. So about 10 years ago, I decided that I wanted to have a relationship with God. And at the, at the time, there were a few people in my life that I really looked up to spiritually. They were kind and happy and so sure of themselves and how much they loved God. And I just thought, wow, I, I really want that. Um, and so I asked a few people to study the Bible with me Peggy Bragg is in the back over there, <laughs> um, because I wanted to have what they had. And so we sat down every Saturday for about eight months so that I could figure out what that meant. And I would say that for about six months, I completely missed the point. I was set on doing it because I felt like studying the Bible was equal to following the law and, doing, and also doing the right thing. Meanwhile, my heart was nowhere in sight. And so re reading the Bible had become a ritual with no heart in my life. Um, I could answer questions about the Bible, but I had no connection to them. And then at that six-month point, I realized that loving God is, about, is as much about my heart as it is about my mind. And all that time studying the Bible actually meant nothing if my heart was not connected to it. And at the end of the day, I think, truthfully, I was scared 
I was scared to see that following the rules wasn't enough to build my relationship with God. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and I'm going to read uh, 23 through 25. Um, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I'm going to skip down to uh, verse 28 as well. It says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Um, got a little excited. Uh, <laughs> sometimes when I take communion, I forget to look where my heart's at. I forget that it's my responsibility to prepare my heart to remember G who Jesus is and what he's done. I can sit in the chair and take the cup and uh, eat the bread and make it look like I'm following tradition. But when I do that, I'm just missing the point again. Um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, they observed the Passover in the Old Testament. Um, God delivered the Israelites from intense suffering and slavery in Egypt. After, God asked the Israelites to celebrate Passover as a reminder of who he is and that they had been delivered. And when we celebrate communion now, this is a similar moment uh, to remember who Jesus is and what it costs to be delivered from our own suffering. And so now, when I ask myself the question, what does it mean to prepare my heart for communion, I know that I am preparing myself to partake in the tradition of the cup and the bread, but what I'm actually doing is remi reminding myself to honor God and remember Jesus and what his sacrifice means to me. And so this morning, as we share in this tradition, just want to encourage us all to truly remember Jesus, not for the sake of tradition, but with our heart fully on board. So, thank you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is um, to take a moment to reflect on what is tradition and where our hearts are truly at. God, we know that you died for each and every one of us so that we would have the ability and the opportunity to come before you with a clear conscience, confessing our sins to you, Lord, and letting your blood run over us. Father, I pray that this time of reflection would serve as a time of remembrance for who you are and who we are in reference to you because of you. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your, your patience, your grace. Uh, Lord, we pray all of this in your son's Jesus, in son Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, well that concludes our communion service. And um, here's Victoria Wright to lead us through our contribution thoughts. Thank you. I got a clap without saying anything. <laughs> well, um, my name is Victoria, and I'd like to share a scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians, let's see, chapter 9, verse 6, and in New Living Translation, it says, um, so as part of our contribution um, this morning, I'd like to share a few thoughts that I've had um, just reflecting in preparation for today. So it says, in, starting in verse 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all, so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Um, and then I'm going to skip to... Um, verse 12, and it says, This service that you perform is not only supporting the need of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Oops. I just did something. Okay. Um, thanks to God. Because of the service, technology, because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So, um, so I'd like to just share a few thoughts that kind of came to mind. Um, I thought about times where I have organized an event um, either a birthday party for a friend or a family member, um, and, you know, or making a birthday cake for someone's birthday, or hosting a dinner, um, or organizing a small group at my, at my place. And I know the effort it takes and the risk of the money or funds, the forethought and resource that goes into planning, um, that goes in the planning of the success or the missed opportunities of my planning. I've also attended functions where I've had no part in planning. I get there and there's a seat waiting for me. There's food that I haven't prepared waiting to be consumed um, and entertainment for me to enjoy. Um, and then on top of that, I also think about the church. It is made of, it is made of, oh, okay. It is made of uh, baptized followers of Christ, disciples with one spirit as to form one body as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And Christ is the head of that body, the church, Ephesians, 2, 5, uh, Ephesians 5, 22. And we all play an important role in this house of ours, the church. And in thinking about Christ, I also recall a message Tyler gave a while back and I remember it because he had me up here interviewing me about um, Christ being the chief cornerstone. Um, and if you recall, his point was looking at Christ as the chief cornerstone in the way we fashion ourselves to be like him. And one of the attributes that I find in Christ is his generosity towards us um, and towards others, um, towards everyone. Um, and I guess to summarize just these thoughts, um, you know, we all have ownership in this house, the church, knowing that not all of us own a home, including myself, I guess more way that I can relate it is to um, the responsibility that I felt when I planned something. So, you know, as a church, a group of disciples who follow Christ, our ownership is not or should not be in a prideful way, um, but with a spirit of gratitude that... Um, to have the ability to con contribute, to give money to the mission and treasure that we have all found in Christ. Um, so by doing so, we just we bring him glory and um, make opportunities for those who um, are yet to seek him. So um, just wanted to share that with you this morning. Gary's going to pray for us. 
Mm, thanks, Victoria. That was really great. Appreciate that. All right, let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we uh, thank you so much for the church. We thank you so much for the opportunity to have an ownership in your church, Father. And uh, we just uh, grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to give. And uh, at this time, we just pray you'd bless the offering. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Um, well, the time you've all been waiting for, it's time for the announcements. Buckle in. It's going to be a wild ride. Uh, just a couple of announcements for us today. The first one is that midweek will be in small groups this week. So the reason that throws us out of our normal rhythm, um, but it's because of teen camp, that's what is going on, which is also something for us to pray for. Pray for teen camp and its impact and, and all the efforts that are going into uh, nurturing the youth in the next generation. It's an incredible thing they're doing there. Uh, but midweeks are in small groups this week. If you are visiting or have yet to be connected to a small group, this is an incredible opportunity for fellowship in your community. We have small groups that meet all over the greater Boston area. And so if you're looking to get connected, um, talk to any one of us here or fill out a Connect card that I'll talk about later. Um, we'd love to help you get connected to a group in your area. Um, secondly, um, Friday, August 18th, which is this coming Friday, um, the Ignite Ministry has a devotional. Now, if you don't know what the Ignite Ministry is, this is our all Boston singles ministry. So singles from all over the greater Boston area come together, and specifically this Friday, coming together for a time of worship and inspiration and connection. We actually have a guest speaker. One of our, our new church leaders in New Hampshire, J.J. Griffin, is going to be coming and speaking at this devotional. And so if you are a part of this group, please come. It's going to be an incredible time together. It'll be truly inspiring. And uh, finally, after the service today, we are going to have some tea and coffee in the gym. And so feel free to go get refreshed as you fellowship. And with that being said, we're going to take a couple minutes here to have a short fellowship break. And so we'll come back in about two minutes with the song. So don't go too far, uh, but go ahead and stand on up, give somebody a hug, and we'll be back in two minutes.
Test, 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 test. One, two, three, four, five. Uh -huh. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check.
All right, it's great to be together this morning, and I have the privilege and the honor and the joy to uh, introduce our speaker to you. For most of you, Sean Wooten doesn't need an introduction. Uh, most of you know Sean, and uh, maybe I can give you one or two things you don't know yet. But if you don't know Sean, um, you are in for a great treat. You will see an inspiring man. Sean is from Kansas, and he was ready to embark on a Wall Street career, and he became a Christian. At the young age of 22 or 23, he became a Christian, and he began a life totally devoted to the kingdom of God. As a young Christian, he went on a mission team to Moscow, and he has many stories. We heard a few of them yesterday, uh, how he lived as a young Christian in Moscow, building, helping to build the Moscow church. And then he married a wonderful Russian woman, Lena, uh, and Lena and Sean together planted a church in Kiev, Ukraine, in sometime 1992 or something like that. Um, and he continued to serve in the Ukraine. I got to know him um, when he was in the Ukraine. Um, he actually also worked for a while for Hope Worldwide. He has a tremendous heart for the poor and for the needy. Um, he, by the way, has also wonderful kids. He has two kids. Uh, Gunya, one of his two kids, is a tremendous missionary currently together with him, together with her husband, Mark. Um, and then uh, Andrew, his son, who is one of the smartest kids that I know. He uh, is at Stanford University right now. But Sean, <clears throat> Sean is the real thing. Sean is a disciple first and foremost. And uh, Sean works in the European Mission Society uh, now for almost 20 years. And he helps build the churches all around uh, Europe uh, and uh, helps many churches in the world to do well. And uh, I'm very excited to hear Sean. Sean is a great friend. Uh, Sean is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, one of the most inspiring persons you can meet. And uh, I give you Sean Wooden. Thank you, Bill. Very kind of you. I won't sing. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Valder, for that very warm introduction. Um, it's a real honor for me to be with you this morning, uh, this incredible fellowship in Boston. If you're visiting here today, welcome. And it's not just a neighborhood church that's just not far from somebody's home. This is really a group of people who've had a dream on their hearts for 40 years to help the gospel and good news spread all over the world. And uh, this group also supports a mission society called the European Mission Society uh, that has allowed people like myself and my wife and many others to have the opportunity to go carry the good news um, to other parts of the world that haven't heard it. And we're all one team. And I'm so thankful for all of you, so thankful for all your years of sacrifice. Uh, you are an incredible fellowship. So if you could give yourselves a round of applause, I would like you to do that. Um, and of course, to be with the Kohas, Valder has been mentor slash best friend slash friend slash friend slash <laughs> boss slash friend slash mentor um, for the last 20 some years. And you know, all of us, we go through good times spiritually, we go through hard times spiritually, and it's those brothers and sisters around us uh, year after year that help us get through those tough patches. And I just wanted to extend a thank you to the Koha family, Irene and Valder, for loving me and Lena. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's not so easy. Um, but I do appreciate this fellowship, this church, and, and all of you. Um, so the topic for today is build, but before I do that, Valerie introduced me a little bit, but let me just show you a couple pictures. This is my wife, Lena. Um, she's born in Moscow. This is my daughter, Diana and Andrew. They were both also born in Moscow, but my daughter just married a Ukrainian. So our family is Ukrainian, Russian, and American, which is very complicated today. Um, but in the kingdom, that all works. Uh, so that's good. Uh, I went on the mission team to Kiev, Ukraine. This is the actual mission team. Um, and that tiny little fellowship, uh, in, its first, in its first week, 500 people came to church. 
uh, for the very first church service. Uh, many people became Christians. Then I moved actually to St. Petersburg, was on the mission team there for about a year, then came back to Kiev uh, to lead the church with my soon-to-be wife. Um, and we led the church there for two and a half years. It grew from 150 to 1,600 in two and a half years, became the largest church, Christian church in the country of the Ukraine. Um, and that caused actually problems with me and the government. So I actually got kicked out of the Ukraine, uh, moved to Russia, uh, where we started uh, Hope Worldwide in Moscow. Um, and actually our first event where we uh, encouraged 2,000 orphans, I invited Michael Jackson, and he came. And that's me and Michael Jackson. Uh, so he came to that event and encouraged the orphans, which was incredible. Uh, we were there for 10 years and then moved back to the Ukraine where we continued to lead the church there for almost 15 years. Uh, and this is my favorite picture of the Kiev church. It's a wonderful fellowship. Um, there's about 700 people there left right now because of the war. There's 1,000 Ukrainian disciples spread out all over Europe um, and continue to pray for peace, um, as I know many of you have been praying. Um, but we're a part of the wonderful family of churches called Eastern Europe. Um, we love this part. So a new leadership uh, started to lead the churches in Ukraine, so me and my wife could launch into the other countries that are smaller than the Ukraine but need encouragement. Uh, so basically, we packed up our bags. Um, we gave away everything that doesn't fit in one and a half suitcases. Uh, and then COVID hit, so probably not the best timing, but as you see, the very busy airport in the background. Um, we were literally the only people traveling. Uh, nobody was crazy enough to travel four months into COVID. Um, but we traveled with an amazing team. Uh, we call it the Revive Team. And you can ask, uh, actually, we have Michael, who was on the very first team. He's here. And Aubrey who came over on the second team, uh, Heroes, who served on Revive. And if you want to know more about it, you can talk to them as well. Uh, but we launched out. Uh, crazy things happened. We were supposed to go to Budapest. COVID closed the doors. We landed in Turkey, of all places. Uh, then the doors opened that we could actually get into the Ukraine. So we landed in Odessa. So here we are in Odessa. There's Michael there in the back. Um, and even though we took a team of 20 English speakers into a country that doesn't speak English in the middle of a COVID pandemic when everything shut down for cold contact evangelism. Doesn't seem like the smartest idea, does it? Um, but God blessed. Uh, 18 people became Christians in that seven months. Uh, it was amazing how God worked. Then we decided to go to Zagreb, Croatia. That was our next destination, but the doors closed there, and we ended up in Kishinev, Moldova. Um, and you're thinking, okay, where is Moldova? It's stuck between Romania and Ukraine. Um, but for whatever reason, we didn't understand it at the time. We landed in Moldova. Uh, then about six months later, uh, this happened. Uh, there was the invasion of uh, the 24th of February. Uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And then all the pieces came together. We were nine months in Odessa building the relationships there. Then we landed three hours away from Odessa in Kishinev, Moldova. And when the war hit, the church of 300 in Odessa fled the borders to try and find refuge and a place to sleep and eat. And we were waiting for them in Kishinev, Moldova, uh, where we had basically taken over a hotel and turned it into a refugee center. And we provided 11,000 warm beds and 33,000 hot meals. Uh, to take care of brothers and sisters and other people who just wandered in uh, to the refugee center who actually ended up studying the Bible and becoming Christians as well. Uh, so God worked in an amazing way. Also during the chaos of the war, my daughter got married. So this is her wedding picture. Oops, nope. So, uh, and that was also a miracle because Moldova can't marry you unless you're Moldovan. Um, but we figured, we found a nuance in the constitution of Moldova. And we presented it to the authorities, and they changed their mind, and they married my daughter and her husband. They were the first non-Moldovans in the history of the country to get married in Moldova. So in life, if you're never sure what to do, read the Bible. If you're ever stuck in your country, get out the Constitution and figure out what you're allowed to do. Um, that worked for us anyways. Uh, so this is the Revive 3.0 team. Very proud of them. They all went home July 1st, um, and the church in Kishinev. Uh, God has really blessed it. These are all the baby Christians uh, that became Christians in Kishinev. Uh, this is actually a picture of the church when the team arrived in September, and this is a picture of the church in July when we left. Um, basically, the church went from 40-plus members to 100 members, and basically three Christians underneath the age of 35. Now there's 42 Christians underneath the age of 35. Uh, there's now a campus ministry, a team ministry, and a young professional ministry that's super fired up about being Christian. So God is blessed. 
<clears throat> so, and um, in three weeks, I moved to Romania. Uh, my one and a half, my one and a half suitcases are in Valder's uh, trunk. So my home right now is in the trunk of Valdor. Uh, in three weeks, my home will have moved to Romania. Um, so, but it's, it's an incredible blessing to get to serve. Um, pray for us, pray for us that we can land in Romania, that the documents worked out, that everything happens, and that that church of 30 plus members, whose youngest Christian is nine years ago, um, we're just really praying that many people will become Christians in Romania. If you want to follow me in some of these crazy adventures, get out your phone and take a picture of this. This is me on Instagram. You can follow it. We post pictures of Revive and what's happening. Um, Instagram. And if you want to be really adventurous with your smartphone, um, and if you didn't get time to get connected now, you can talk to somebody here. Most people, some people here are probably following me. This is Telegram. And Telegram is similar to like a WhatsApp or a Viber, but here we actually post updates from the Ukraine. What's happening to our brothers and sisters there? What's happening on Revive? Prayer requests. Um, what are we teaching on Revive? What's happening? In, if you want a closer picture of what's happening in Revive, you can follow us on Telegram. Um, also, we just opened up applications for Revive 5.0. Uh, so we haven't lost, launched 4.0, but we're already gathering the team for 5.0. Um, and if you think next September you would like to come spend 10 months overseas and help us turn one of these countries around or encourage the churches, please consider signing up uh, for Revive. Amen. Let's jump into the Bible, shall we? Called to build. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, God is faithful. God is never late. God is never early. God doesn't forget. God doesn't miscalculate. God knows exactly what's happening. God knows exactly what's going on in your life right now, and he has an incredible plan to take care of you. God loves you, and God is faithful. Now, it says here he's called you, and that word called is actually like the word summoned, like, like a president or a king would summon somebody into your presence. I mean, I don't know if you went to, you know, when you go to school, the principal summons you. You're a little bit nervous about that. But God summons you into fellowship with his son. It's incredible to think. This is the first thing we have to understand. This is the first thing I want us to understand. You have been summoned by God. Out of the seven billion people living on this planet today, out of the millions living in this city, he brought you here. You may think somebody brought you here, God brought you here. He has summoned you here. And he summons you for a reason. He summons you into fellowship with his son. Now we just took a fellowship break, which was very encouraging, but actually the word fellowship goes a step deeper than that. It actually means like this all-in partnership. It's like a complete mutual partnership in the same dream, same goal, same desire, different gifts, but the same enthusiasm and same direction, two people doing something together. That's a fellowship. And we've been called into fellowship with Jesus. So we want to do exactly and think exactly and understand and act and speak and think and live we're in fellowship with him. We're a partnership with him. Whatever he's trying to accomplish, we're with him equally. Now, we do it different than how he would do it, but we still do what we can do in that partnership. Does that make sense? Okay, let's, let me illustrate this just a little more. This is Messi. He's a, he's a if you've never heard of him, he's a, he's a soccer player or football player, um, depending on how you understand that sport. So if you... If you go into fellowship with Messi, for instance, for 365 days, you are in fellowship with him. Like, you get up when he gets up, you run where he runs, you kick when he kicks, you're at practice where he's at practice, you're, you're with him all day, every, like, if you're with him all day, every day for 365 days and do exactly what he does, just imitate, you will be a better soccer player in a year than you are now. Now, will you be as good as Messi? No. You still won't. Sorry. And sometimes we get confused in our Christianity that you're never going to be exactly like Messi. But you'll be so much better. Right? Okay, for those of you who aren't into sports. Einstein. 
If you had fellowship with Einstein, right, like if you woke up in the morning and all day long just solving problems with him and writing things down and all that, until you go to bed, you're just, and maybe you don't even understand physics now, but I guarantee you 365 days from now, you'll know physics more than you do today. There would be huge progress being in fellowship with a guy like Einstein. And for those of you who aren't into, into physics at all, equals mc squared is energy equals my coffee squared. <laughs> energy, my coffee times two. That's, that's energy. Okay, what if you went into fellowship with him? You, you wake up in the morning, you're with him, you walk with him, you, you, you ask him questions in the morning, you read what he's reading, you're praying when he's praying, you're talking to people when he's talking to you. Everything he does, you do. Now, are you going to be exactly like him after a year? Well, no, you're not. Will you be much different than you are today? For sure. That's fellowship. That's, you've been called to this. You haven't been called to learn something. You've been called to a partnership. Isn't that amazing? Amen? So this partnership results in what? What do we do in this partnership? Let's look at this. Matthew 16. Jesus is asking a question. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now, for those of you who don't know, Messiah means like savior, like somebody who's saving people. So if a Messiah is someone who's going to save you, basically, right? So you are the Messiah, Peter, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that on Peter that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, let's take a moment to, to check out this verse. So it says here, Jesus announces he's the Messiah. Like this is the first time he confirms it. He announces it. Like he's now saying it. I'm here to save the world, which must be incredibly encouraging for us to hear. Jesus is here to save you. But then the question had to pop into the guy's minds around him. Okay, you're here to save us because we're standing here. How are you going to save the whole world? I mean, without a TikTok or Instagram or Facebook, how would you actually reach the whole world? Like, how, how do you do that? And what about 2,000? How is he going to save people 2,000 years from now? Never wrote a book, not a governor, not, didn't, didn't, he, He's just a simple man from a village of 500 people. How is he going to save the entire planet? What's the plan? What's the strategy? How do you accomplish that? And he rolls out the strategy right in the next word. I will build my church. That's it. That's the strategy. That's the plan. plan that's plan A. There's no plan B. His church is the plan to even reach somebody 2,000 years later. It's the plan to reach somebody in a country that doesn't even know anything about. His church is the plan to change the world. It's how you save the world, you build the church. Now today, when people hear the word church, there's lots of confusing ideas that pop into people's heads. The word church actually means group of people. Emma alluded to that. It's a group of people who just want to follow Jesus. That's a church. Now when we think of church, sometimes we think of a building. Sometimes we think of something that's incredibly boring. Like, I, I ran from church my entire life. I hated church. Um, it's, it's just somewhere you just come for two hours a week, and then you go home and do something else. Um, and sometimes churches are incredibly beautiful and architectural. Like, wow, that's impressive. But that's, that's not the Bible idea. When Jesus says, I came to build my church, he wasn't talking about that. And even sometimes the way we ask and answer questions... Where is church? Church is standing right here. Church is sitting over there and over there. And Church is probably going to bed in Eastern Europe right now. Church is getting up in L.A. This church woke up, brushed his teeth this morning, looked in the mirror and wished he had more hair, but that's okay. <laughs> Where's church? I don't know. Church is wherever you are. That's where church is. Church doesn't stop and... When is church? What do you mean, when is church? When church is, well, church is still breathing, so church is now. Uh, church is right here and right now. It doesn't really start. 
It doesn't really finish. It's not really at a location. This has to be the most beautiful church building I've ever seen. That's the church. Just some people following Jesus. Are they exactly like Jesus? No. Are they as good as Jesus? No. Do they try? They're trying. Are they getting better? They are. We're getting better. We're trying. But we're his group. We're his church. You, you are his plan to save the world. Amen? And it says here, the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. Okay. In my, I love the Marvels and all these superhero movies, but... And I'm thinking, okay, the church and the gates of Hades won't overcome us. Like, they won't attack us and take over us. We got it. We can defend ourselves against the gates. And I'm going to, you know, I have this defensive mindset. I'm going to defend myself against the gate. Wait a minute. Gates don't attack. Gates don't move. Gates stand there. Gates aren't aggressive. Gates are protecting something. Gates are trying to keep something in. And then I thought, you know what? Satan pretty much runs this world. Most of this world is in the gates of his kingdom. But the encouragement for us is that the gates can't stop us. We can actually break through their, his gates, snatch people out, and pull them. The gates of Hades cannot stop us. The gates of Hades cannot stop his church from snatching people and helping them be saved. Amen? Which is encouraging. I appreciated getting invaded uh, a few years back. Um, I was an atheist, uh, an atheist at the University of Kansas, electrical and computer engineer, just landed my job on Wall Street, and I was on the tennis team, varsity tennis team. So I was an atheist, very arrogant, very confident, and a tennis coach reached out to me and said, hey, do you believe in God? I said, are you kidding me? God is for people who have nothing better to do with their lives. And he's like, why do you think that? I said, well, I'm an engineer, I'm too smart, I believe in evolution and all this. And he's like, well, did you know that there was a guy who, who prayed and the sun stopped for 24 hours? And the, did you know that there's a 24-hour hole in the space-time continuum that dates back to the exact time when that person prayed and the sun stopped? And he pulls out this article, which to this day I can't find it. I think he made it up. I don't know. But, it, <laughs> but man, did it work on me. I went home freaked out thinking, oh, my gosh, what if there is a God? And if there is a God, then there's a heaven and a hell. And if there's a heaven and a hell, oh, my gosh. I cannot be wrong about this. And I literally couldn't sleep. I came back to him the next day. I said, okay, I think I believe in God. What do I do? And he's like, wow, okay, well, pray with me. Tell God you're sorry, and, and you'll be saved. And I was like, so I just pray with you, and I'll be saved? He's like, yeah, tell God you love him, and you'll be saved. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I was in a bar last night, and after about my eighth beer, I think I told everybody in the bar that I love him, but today I don't even know who they are. Like, I've said all kinds of things that I don't, stick to. Are you sure that's all? I just have to say one phrase and that's it? Like he dies on a cross and I'm just going to say a sentence? And we argued and I said, you know, thank you for helping me believe in God, but I think you're wrong. So I got in a car, I drove to the Walgreens, I bought a Bible, best medicine at Walgreens, Bible, amen. <laughs> I'm not quite sure they still sell it there, but bought a Bible, went home and I said, I got to figure this out. I opened up to Matthew chapter 1, and I read Matthew chapter 1. Someone's a father, someone's a father, someone's a father, someone's a... Closed, and I thought, I have no idea what to do. <laughs> except maybe become a father. I don't know. <laughs> like, what do, I, <laughs> what do I do with this? I closed the Bible, and I said probably the most sincere prayer I've ever said in my entire life. It lasted about 15 seconds, and I said, God, if you're out there, help me find you. Two days later, freezing temperature, walking on campus... A guy stops me on campus and invites me to a Bible talk, and that was Dale. And I came to a Bible talk, I studied the Bible, and I became a Christian. If he didn't stop me on the street that day, and it was funny, I went back to the University of Kansas and took a picture of the pavement where he stopped me. Like, I'm so thankful for this chunk of asphalt, <laughs> because it sent me now to Moldova. Like, what in the world? God is so amazing. Amen, church? God has a dream for all of us to help other people to know him. Dale broke through the gates of Hades and snatched me out of my immoral, drunken, lying life and allowed me to have Jesus, learn about Jesus as my Savior. Amen? 
And then it says here, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will lose in heaven. Now, if you're visiting, you're going to want to ask somebody about what I'm about to say. But there were two keys that were given to Peter. And those two keys are the key to get into God's kingdom, get into heaven uh, one day. And it says the two keys, and you'll have to look at this in the Bible later, is repentance, which basically means stop living for yourself, but follow Jesus. Want to be like Jesus, be his disciple. And when you make that decision, you get to be baptized for the forgiveness of all your sins, and you receive the Holy Spirit. Those two keys get you in the door. They get you into the kingdom. Whatever gets into the kingdom on earth through those two doors will be bound in heaven. Whoever does not use those two keys on earth will be lost on earth and lost in heaven forever. That's it. Jesus says, I have a dream to save the whole world, and and I'm going to build my church. That's actually people. It's not a building. And, And the keys to get into that group are change your life, become a Christian, and get baptized, and you're in now, and you're in forever. Choose not to do it, you're out now, you're out forever. And I want to encourage us as a church, let's not change the Bible. I appreciate that our world doesn't seem to think that there's truth in anything. We cannot change this. There are two keys, it's not negotiable. Even if we decide to vote on it, it doesn't matter. This is what the Bible teaches, amen? Now, we can't make someone open the door, but we can pass out the keys. That's what we do. That's what the church does. We pass out the keys that there's actually a better way to live your life and you can spend eternity in heaven. This is the Titanic. Um, As you know, it sank. Um, If you've seen the movie, don't watch all of it. There's pieces you shouldn't see. But um, if you watch the Titanic movie, if you watch it, when people were getting on the Titanic, it was interesting because there's all these different classes. Like there's this VIP class and this super wealthy class, and then there's like this middle class, and then there's like this, like, no class, or, you know, like, engine class or something. And there's all these classes getting on, and there's all this pomp about how you get on the boat, and what class am I, and everyone's comparing themselves, and everyone's getting on the boat. But then, unfortunately, tragically, the boat sank, and when the boat sank, there were rescue boats, and people got it, some people got into the rescue boat, then the rescue boats headed for America, And when it got to the Bank of America, there were two signs put up on shore. On top of one of the signs, the word was written saved. And on top of the other sign was the word written lost. And everybody's name that was on the passenger list getting on the boat was put on one of those two boards, saved or lost. There's no third board. There's only two boards. And everybody on the boat, no matter who they were, Landed on one of those two boards. Our world is so concerned about the getting on the boat lists. Am I married? Not married. Am I single? Am I educated? Not educated. Am I wealthy? Do I have this? Do I not have this? Am I American or am I Ukrainian? Am I Russian? Am I white? Am I black? There's so many categories of what we think is important getting on the boat or being on the boat. God looks at us with two lists saved or lost. All those other lists that really concern us and that fill our schedules and anxiety, actually, they're not his lists. Saved or lost. You're sitting here this morning. Your name right now is on one of two lists. Saved or lost. And that's what's most important to us. Amen, church? This is kind of funny, but it's kind of true. How to invite your friends and family to church. Come with me if you want to live. <laughs> it's, it's true, right? Come with Jesus if you want to live. He wants you to live. He loves you. He died on a cross for you. He wants you in heaven. He wants you on the save list. All you have to do is say, I want it too. And pursue it. Amen, church? Then we need to build together. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I love this verse. It says, encourage one another daily. Like, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And that's actually what church is. It's a group of people who are loved by Jesus, who come together to love other people the same way Jesus loves them. I love coming to church. I love being with you guys because Jesus commanded you to love me the way Jesus loves you. 
You actually don't have a choice about it. You're commanded. I walk in here and there's 200 people that have been commanded to love me. Okay, let's get this started. This is awesome. This is an amazing environment, right? It's, it's incredible to think, and where else do you go in the world where everybody around you is going to love you and care for you and be honest and open? And Where do you go in this world that does that? Let's test it. What we're going to do right now is we're going to stand up, but don't move out of your area. You're going to stand up and you're going to hug the people around you and just say, God loves you. Now, if you're not a hugger, don't worry, just kind of fake it or whatever, you know, but... <laughs> But let's just stand up. I want to spur you on towards love and good deeds. Around. Stand up and say, God loves you to your neighbors. Say, say to the people around you, God loves you. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and be seated. This was a very dangerous experiment. Let's be seated. Please sit. God loves you. Go ahead and be seated. God loves you. Let's be seated. God would love for you to be seated. God loves you. Let's be seated. Okay, let's go ahead and be seated. Let's be seated. Let's be seated. Now say to each other, God wants us to sit down. Okay, let's, God wants us to sit down. Okay, awesome. You guys were very good. I'm very proud of this fellowship. Now, now I look across this, now I look across this room and even some of the, everyone here is smiling right now because you were spurred on towards love and good deeds. It's not just coming in and leaving and attending something. For You're coming to love and be loved. You're coming to grow in your love because all of us are holding the keys to the kingdom and we need encouragement to go out and share them. Amen? You know, I wanted to share a story about how encouragement changed somebody's life. This is Dennis. That's me to the left. I know you don't recognize it, but um, Dennis was the first person I ever appointed an evangelist. He was 22 years old, single brother, a Ukrainian brother, leading a region of 250 campus kids at the age of 22. Uh, and he was, uh, became an evangelist, uh, and about three months after he was appointed an evangelist, he was diagnosed with cancer. And they basically told him he had two months to live. And unfortunately, his cancer really progressed. And after about one month, he couldn't leave his room anymore. He could barely stand up, but what he, would, he, what he kept, he said, you know, Sean, I want to keep leading my region until I'm no longer here. And he said, bring me everybody who wants to study the Bible, and I'll study with them and tell them that I'm not afraid because God loves me and I'm going to go be with him. And he studied, 30 people became Christians that he studied the Bible with that last month when he was bedridden. He studied the Bible with 30 people that became Christians, which was incredible. Now, his mom was an atheist married to, the, to a colonel in the KGB who, by the way, helped get the Ukrainian mafia off my back when I was having trouble with the mafia. Different story. Um, and he... She would sit next to him as he was going to bed, and she was, a, she was just a complete atheist and didn't believe in anything. And she sat there by his bedside. He finally fell asleep, and she looked at the little, the, the little uh, stool thing there next to his bed, and it had a stack of like 100 letters from brothers and sisters who just wrote words of encouragement to Dennis, like what he meant to them, verses to encourage him, events that they had in common, just these really deep heartfelt letters. And mom, bored with nothing to do and couldn't fall asleep and looking at Dennis, decides to read through all the letters. And she starts to read letter after letter after letter, reading all the verses in the letter, reading all the words of kindness and love in the letter. And she just starts weeping and she goes through every single letter. Dennis wakes up and her mom's face is just drenched. He says, mom, what's wrong? He says, Dennis, I, I've read, I read all these letters that the brothers and sisters wrote to you. And he said, what do you think? And she said, I think I believe in God. I want to study the Bible. I've never read anything like this. And she started studying the Bible. Seven days later, she was ready to be baptized. The brothers and sisters literally held, they literally held Dennis up. He was too weak. He was too weak to stand on his own. And standing in the circle and sharing about mom, Dennis said, you know, Mom, from the day I got baptized, I never stopped praying that you would become a Christian. And I always prayed that no matter what it would take, God would bring you into his kingdom. And if it was my cancer that helped you see God's love, I'm thankful. I have peace. And Dennis baptized his mom and one week later passed away. The power of encouragement 
the power of just taking five minutes, look somebody in the eye, and just tell them how important they are to you, to God, and how much God loves you, and how much God can you. It's so powerful to really encourage. If everyone here walks in here thinking, I will not leave here until I've encouraged five, ten, I'm going to encourage daily my small group. And, and, and you don't walk out of here until you've been encouraged. And if nobody encourages you, walk up to somebody and say, hey, <laughs> make it happen. I need encouragement. It's okay to say that. Be, I need encouragement. I'm going through a hard time. Encourage me. That's okay. Amen, church? You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. For in just a little while, he is coming, and he will not delay. We have to persevere. I don't know about you, but when I first started this whole Christianity thing, I thought, this is going to get easier the longer I do it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been more wrong. And as you, and as you saw the, the, the revive things, I make a lot of wrong mistakes. But it gets harder and harder. We have to persevere. When I moved over to Russia, I had pneumonia almost every year. Uh, I was mugged. Everything I owned was robbed. And then later I studied the Bible with a guy, and during, during we were talking about sin, he said, you know what, I need to confess, I actually robbed apartments. And I was like, hmm, which, which apartments did you rob? And, and he robbed my apartment. <laughs> so I studied with the Bible who stole everything I owned. Um, he felt really guilty. I forgave him. Amen. I'm still working. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> but he already gave all my stuff away, so that didn't actually result in anything, except in becoming a Christian, which is more important. Amen. <laughs> I've had KGB issues. I've had Ukrainian mafia issues. We've been bugged. We've been videoed. Um, anything and everything. Right now, there's literally nowhere on this planet me and my wife can live for more than 90 days together. All my junk is in the trunk of Valder Koha. You may, it may sound like there's a, but we have to persevere. And I don't know what's waiting for me four weeks from now. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know where I'm going to be living. But all I know is that there's going to be a group, a disciples, a church, and we're going to run around spreading the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And it's going to be awesome. And I got you guys praying for me. And some of you guys are going to sign up for 5.0. And it's going to be awesome. And we're going to do this together. And there's going to be special missions. And you're going to sacrifice. And we're doing this together. But we have to persevere. Is it hard? Yes. Have you been disappointed? Yes. Did somebody hurt you? Yes, 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 yes. But we persevere. We persevere. Amen? Redwood trees, very tall. How tall? Very tall. And they live like 2,000 years, 2,000, 3,000 years. That's insane. Now, redwood trees, oops, that was doomed to happen at some point. One second. Hopefully we can get this back up. Excellent. You would think with a tree like the redwoods, the, the roots must go really deep to stand for 2,000 years and be so big. Uh, but actually, the truth of the matter is roots of a redwood tree only go six feet deep. As, as deep as I am. That's as deep as a redwood tree root goes, which is insane if you think about it. So how do they stand? What they do is the roots go sideways, and they hold on to each other. And redwood trees always grow together. Now, we go deep with Jesus, but then we go sideways. with. That's why Jesus built the church. You cannot do this alone. We have to hold on to each other. we got to believe in each other and love each other. Amen, church? But my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Amen, church? Now, it says, it says shrinks back. What that literally means is the lowering of the sails. It means literally lower the sails. Now, if you're in a boat and there's a storm, what do you do? You lower the sails. Otherwise, the wind will knock you over. But when the storm's over, what do you do? You raise the sails back up. Why? Because you have somewhere to go. Now, the temptation is after you've been through a storm is to leave the sails down. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. I got hurt. Nope, I'm not putting myself out there again. I got hurt. Nope, I'm not doing it. I'm leaving the sails down. What's your dream? No dream. My sails are down. I'm just existing here. No. 
raise the sails. Sean, last time I raised the sails, there was a storm. I know. And there will be another one. And you can lower it when you, hit that sail, when you hit that storm. But now, sails up. We have somewhere to go. This city needs your sails up. Europe needs your sails up. Amen? Sails up. We can't shrink back. I wanted to share. I went through a really hard time when I, planted the, when I went on the church planting to Kiev. It sounded very glorious when I talked about it, but I was doing so poorly spiritual, I almost lost hope. For five days in a row, I invited like hundreds and hundreds of people to come hear about God. And on Sunday, I show up, there's 500 people in the hall. I'm going through the whole hall. And out of the 800 people I invited, nobody came. All my friends on the mission team, they had 10, 15, 20 people. They were everywhere. Everyone's just gathering these groups of people around. I'm like, oh, thanks for inviting I'm literally standing there alone. I thought lightning was going to strike me. I was so discouraged. But then I got up Monday. I said, okay, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go out today, and I'm going to invite more people and ask them if someone wants to look at the Bible. Because we had an event that night to look at the Bible. So I went out all day long and invited people. And I, I, they said, yeah, we'll come. Yeah, we'll come. Can't wait. Yeah, we'll come. And I show up, and I'm all stuck. Nobody came. 270 people sitting in the hall. I'm the, only per, I'm the only person from the entire team, and nobody was there. They're all studying. They're hanging out. They're having fun. I'm more. I walk to the metro. I sit down in the metro, and I'm sulking. The metro goes. It stops. Goes. Stops. I look up, lifted my head up a little bit. There were four people standing by the door of the metro, that were very energetic and excited, and I thought, you know, sometimes you have that thought in your head, Sean, you should go, go talk to them. And I was like, are you serious? What do you mean go talk to them? I've been talking to people for eight days in a row. Nobody, I'm, I'm taking the day off. Like, I'm done. Metro goes, stops, starts, stops, and they're still standing there. And I thought, Sean, you should go. And I was like, nope, nope, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it. Opens, closed, they're still standing there. Sean, you should go talk to them. I was like, all right, let's make a deal. If they don't leave on the next one, I'll get up and go talk to them. But if they leave, I'm good. So we come to the next stop, the door opens, and I'm literally thinking, please leave, please leave. Like, <laughs> almost praying, leave, 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 leave. The door closes, they're still there. I thought, oh, okay, fine. I walk over with this discouraged, disgruntled face, I said, hey, would you like to come tomorrow night to look at the Bible? And they're like, yeah, man, that would be awesome. I said, yeah, sure, right, whatever, you know. I handed, <laughs> handed them the invitation cards. I was like, yeah, you're like the other 800 people who said, sure, yeah, we'll be right there. And I went back and sat down. The next night I show up, not expecting anyone to come, and two of those four came. <laughs> and all of a sudden I was tempted to think, oh, Sean, you're, no, wait a minute, no, you're not awesome. You're a, dis you're a disaster. This this is just a miracle of God's grace. This is just God working on raw obedience. Like, this is just, God brought these two people. This had nothing to do with me, obviously. I almost deterred them from coming. Um, so they came, and he loved it. And, he, and I went up to him, I said, what do you think? He said, I'd love to study the Bible. I was like, okay, awesome. When do you have time? He said, well, I'm a rugby player, so I can only meet at 6 in the morning. Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay, 6 a.m., not my favorite hour of the morning to meet, but uh, okay, let's do it. So we started studying the Bible, and then I ended up leaving and going back to St. Petersburg. But a week after I'd left, he actually became a Christian. Eager became a Christian, and that other girl who came also became a Christian, which was so encouraging, although very humbling because it had very little to do with anything I was doing, but God totally blessed it. Now, I went back a few years later, and I asked him, I said, bro, who did you end up inviting that became a Christian? And then I went and called them and said, who did you end up inviting them that's still, that's still with us? To, and who did you end up? And who did you end up? And I was just curious what God did through my discouraged, disgruntled, faithless step of raw obedience. And I watch this. This is interesting.
Amen. Even when you're having a bad day, even when you think God can't use me, God can do anything. God can do anything. Amen, church? We belong to those who have faith and are being saved. We belong to those who have faith and are being saved. You know, the day is coming. It's not too far from now. You're going to be in your car on Highway 95, and you're going to be driving, and then all of a sudden you're going to hear this loud noise. It's going to sound like a trumpet, like a trumpet blast, and it's getting louder and louder. You think, Where is this coming from? And, 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 and the car, you, 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 you pull over because it's getting louder and louder and louder, and you're starting to freak out a little bit, and, and you pull over, and you get out of the car, and you look up at the sky, and you see that the, the highway is like a parking lot. And people have come out of their homes, out of their buildings, and they're filling up the streets, and, they're, and they're, everyone's looking at the sky. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And the sky is going to rip open like curtains. And this flood of angels is going to come through the opening. And they're going to fill up the horizon row after row after row, thousands and thousands and millions of angels all chanting, holy, holy, holy. And it's getting louder and louder as there's more and more angels filling up the horizon until it's completely full and then chanting. And you're standing there thinking, oh my gosh, it's a good day to be a disciple, amen. <laughs> and you're freaking out a little bit and, and, and a man riding on a horse with the silhouette of a king comes through the opening and he announces, I'm the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. And that, all the angels fall on their knees. You, your, your, leg, your legs literally give out and you fall on your knees and you're crouched down and all the atheists and Muslims and, and Buddhists and everyone on this planet falls on their knees. And you're crouched down thinking, okay, what happens in the Revelation? When was the last time I read that book? Okay, what's going on? And then all of a sudden you start to float up. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to fly. This is awesome. <laughs> and you get like five, ten feet off the ground. And then you see the people not coming up. And the fear, the look in their eyes, that they actually lived their life for the wrong reason. And you get up above the trees and you start to see the other people coming up from Framingham and, and Boston downtown. And, and all the brothers and sisters start to fly up over Boston. You're like, Bro, check me out. And you're doing somersaults. Sister, oh, I guess we won't have a date this Saturday, but that's okay, right? We're good. <laughs> and you get up, you get up higher. Boston, New York, Maine, New Hampshire. And then you get up even higher and you see Texas, Chicago, Los Angeles. Get up higher and the Moldovans are there. Amen. Pray for me. I want to be there too. And the whole world starts this incredible fellowship and it's unbelievable. And you're so excited. And then all of a sudden, okay, where are we going? And you look up and you see Jesus. For the first time ever, you've pictured him a thousand different ways, but you had no idea what he looked like. And now you can't take your eyes off of him. And now you're being pulled in and you come in and imagine you're standing and you come in and you stand right before Christ and he's looking you right in the eye with a smile on his face and he says, welcome home. And he puts his arms around you and he says into your ear, I'm so proud of you that you didn't give up. And he's going to hug you, and it's going to feel like a thousand arms just wrapped around you. And he says, welcome home. Amen, church? That's what we're building. We build for that day. We build for the two boards. We persevere, we hold on to one another, and we share the keys with this incredible city. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for listening. Pray for us. Check, check. Amen. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sean. Um, thank you for your faith and your wisdom. Uh, we serve an amazing God, don't we? What an amazing God we serve. And I even love um, the, the picture that was drawn of the opportunity that we have to be in fellowship and partnership with Jesus. And not only what that does for us, but what it does for others. 
And so I hope you're leaving our time here today with more faith and vision and connection and inspiration than you came in with. It's hard not to after hearing something like that. Um, you know, and I, I just wanted to bring this to our attention. These are the connect cards. If something about today struck a chord with you, if your heart was softened, if, if the Holy Spirit planted a seed within your heart, please fill out one of these connect cards. Study the Bible. Find out what it's going to take for you to be in fellowship and partnership with our God. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite the worship team back up. Um, but before we close with our last song, Ryan has one thing she wants to say. Yes, I just have a couple uh, things just to let you guys know about. First off, we have Alex with us today who's back from India. She spent the past few months in India. She was with us at Tufts. Please go say hello. Um, ask her how her time was. I'm so excited to even hear more. Alexis is also with us. She was with the Spanish North region last year. We also have our two new Chance of a Lifetime interns today, this weekend. They're not fully here yet. They're going to go home and spend some time with their families after this. But please meet them, Amber and Theo. We're so excited to have you guys. Uh, they'll be at Tufts with us this year. Um, so they will be with you. Please say hello. Get to know them um, this weekend. And then on a bittersweet note, um, Cherie and James Ohen and their beautiful daughter Amari, this is actually their last service with us. Um, Cherie got an amazing job in Amherst, Massachusetts, so they are moving there. But we are just so grateful for you. I know, James, you've been just incredibly serving on the Usher team. Always such a warm face to see for me. Um, and for Charlie and Cherie, we had these fireside chats with the campus girls, and they could just ask any questions. She was like a big sister to them. So we will miss you guys here. Amherst is just getting some really special people, um, but we pray that you can go and, as Sean said, build the church there as well. We love you guys so much. Please stand. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tips its skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God. There is a God.
great day.